Hi everyone, I'm very humbled and happy to be here to tell my story about, well, designing stories. Uh, so yeah, this is me, I'm Yava, a game designer from North Current. I currently oversee the game design of several free-to-play games. And we at North Current uh, have just celebrated 16, sweet 16th birthday, yay to us. Uh, we have over 200 people working in Vilnius, Warsaw and Odessa. And we focus on developing and publishing free-to-play games, mobile first. So naturally, my presentation today will deal with the specifics of free-to-play in narrative design. So we'll go through some common pitfalls and misconceptions about narrative in free-to-play. And we'll deal with some simple tips, techniques and examples from various games of how to just add a little bit of narrative to your game. We'll also have one case study from our own game uh, regarding dialogue. So, let's address the elephant in the room. Uh, some of you may be thinking, do I really need narrative to make a successful game? Will it really get me over the edge? Um, take a look at these top 20 grossing US games and think, how many of them have any type of narrative? So while most of these games may not be story driven, they all have narrative elements in them. So even if your players may not come for the story, the story might actually make some of them stay. So narrative design is quite young still in the free-to-play industry, so it's like of a teenager, really. It's, it still hasn't got an identity, makes a lot of mistakes, it's often dismissed and misunderstood. Uh, narrative designers are often downplayed to just being dialogue writers, cutscene writers, basically people who add in stuff after the game is basically finished. Sometimes they're even called narrative paramedics who just have to swoop in at the very last minute and try to revive a rather lifeless game. But to really design and start designing good narrative in free-to-play, we first should defeat and conquer what I would like to call four horsemen of the narrative apocalypse. So in human language, uh, that would be the four misconceptions when you might have when you start to think of a strategy how to design a narrative for your free-to-play game. So this one's quite common. Uh, it's basically a belief that you can shoehorn narrative after you have completed the art assets, after all the core features have been implemented. So what happens, you try to add in narrative just in between the gaps, but players are not actually actively involved in your stories while they're playing in the core loops. Uh, then there's a belief that unless you have like a three-act structure with a grand conclusion, this epic tale, players will not understand, they will not care, and what we end up doing is uh, we give them a grand conclusion, but then when the time comes, comes for updates and live ops, there's little that brings players back. They're not engaged so much anymore. Then there's also a belief that unless we add all the lore, all the backstories, everything we've written on the world and the characters, players will not understand the world, they will not care for the characters. So what happens is we tend to dump a lot of exposition and we lose players with every gameplay step. And of course there's always the assumption that mobile players just don't care for stories because they're on the bus, they're killing time in a queue, so we just go, ah and we just dismiss designing narrative altogether. And it is very true that we do face specific challenges in free-to-play because of the genre. So new players are not very committed. They're not committed to the game yet, let alone the characters in the world. Uh, they're very easily distracted and very, very impatient. We have short play sessions and also very limited space to show big majestic worlds, to tell grand stories. There's also gates and paywalls that affects everything that you do. In-app purchases often exist outside of the game's world, as well as video ads. So, yeah, <laughs> it might seem like there's a lot of working against stories and against retention sometimes in general. But what narrative can actually do for your game might solve some of those problems. So narrative can help your players be emotionally invested in your game. It's not an unhealthy attachment, but it's a bond and a relationship that will keep them coming back for more. So what exactly can we do in very basic terms? So some tips and techniques now, how to make your players care. 
So first of all, your player is your most important character. So it's all about their role and their fantasies in the game's world. So if you're struggling with a setting, think of a power fantasy first. What power fantasy could your players have? Remember, we are all motivated by very basic human desires. For example, to have an aspirational lifestyle, to be respected, to have street cred, to be desired and loved. So even if your character is a robot or even an inanimate object like a box, their motivations should still be human because that is something that we completely connect on a very primal level. So whether you choose a power fantasy that you know your target audiences have or you want to do something else entirely, empower players to succeed. So align narrative goals with gameplay goals and design your obstacles and your rewards around that power fantasy and make sure that whatever players are doing in the game is bringing them closer to that emotional fulfillment. And if you're designing obstacles, further from it. Even if it's an illusion, an illusion of choice, players will still feel engaged if they think, if they feel like what they're doing is actually making a difference. So, for example, in our hidden object adventure murder in the Alps, uh, the player fantasy is to be the smartest one. So players are always ahead of all the other characters in finding clues, pointing out suspects, just tying the ends together before anyone else does. So every puzzle and dialogue interaction is tailored to reinforce this feeling for the player that only they can actually solve this crime. And by the way, this game is out globally in two days, so you can all try it out and yeah, live your fantasy. Um, so world building, it's very difficult on small screens, right? Uh, we often hear this uh, saying that you should show, you should not tell, but how much space do we really have to show, right? Uh, and players are really eager to just start playing. So it's very important to remember that you should be designing worlds that are interactive. So set up a story using environmental storytelling, art, animation, sound. Set up these little scenes that have lots of feedback for players to play around and encourage them to explore. Words are not necessary here. So at a glance, for example, you, can, you see the time period, you see the place, you see whatever has happened here. And by tapping on various things, players will trigger uh, sound effects, animations, comments from other characters, and they will also find hidden collectibles that might tell them more about the game's world. So it's all interactive. You encourage your players to explore your spaces and explore your stories. So it's very, very important that your game goals align with your narrative. So for example, here in June's Journey, uh, instead of providing players with uh, descriptions of what happened in the crime scene, who is this person, players are actually engaged with these environmental stories while playing. So because of the nature of hidden object scene and its mechanics, you're constantly inspecting the scenes very closely, so inevitably you get immersed into these environmental stories. Uh, similarly, if you have screens where players you know, tend to visit quite often, you can also add a narrative layer there. So for example, this is a personal diary of uh, the protagonist, Anna, and uh, players visit the screen every time it's updated, of course. So it's simple, it's non-intrusive, but you can still add quite a few things just in this one instance. So characters, right? Every engaging world needs good characters. Unfortunately, most of the free-to-play characters by now mostly exist to guide you through tutorials, give you to-do lists, so they're just on standby until the player needs them. But because we relate to human emotions and qualities, we should try to design our characters that are just like us, because we will initially engage with them and care more for them. So these are characters who are imperfect, just like humans. They have both merits and flaws. They have their own motivations in the world. They don't just wait for the player to instruct them. They also have relationships with other characters. And most importantly, they react to how the player is impacting the world. Are they making it a better place? Are they completely annihilating the world? There, there should be a reaction. So these uh, characters from Paradise Bay and Homescapes, for example, 
have their own voices, have their own motivations, have their own traits, they lead their own lives and have their own dreams. They don't just stand there to, you know, serve the player. And most importantly, they are also dynamic. So whatever new is released in the game, the characters also change their voices. And they, uh, they also uh, react to everything that the player is doing in their home world. Uh, now, if you have a very fast-paced game and you just don't want to add any dialogue, you don't want to interrupt the flow, you can also make the best of your social media. So, for example, for Cooking Fever, we share character informations and we show dynamics between characters on Facebook. So, like this, for example, on the World's Bear Day. So, what happens is that players get uh, engaged with this outside the game, and when they come back to the game to play the levels, they have already created their own stories in their heads. If also you, have, you are lucky enough to have uh, fan art, try to feature that as well. It really helps create the player stories. Now, if you want to use dialogue, the most important tip is to set the goals and to set the scope very, very, very early on. Otherwise, you'll get lost. And this is a valuable lesson that we had uh, with our game, The Order of Time Guardians, which is a free-to-play hidden object puzzle. It's still in soft launch. And when we first soft launched the game, uh, we looked into the, our analytics tool to see what's, what's going on. Our players engaged with it. And what we saw was not very, let's say, pleasant. Uh, we saw that we were losing a lot of players in the introductory chapter. So we inspected the contents of our dialogue to see how we could, you know, find a way out. So basically without a clear scope, we were trying to do a lot. Giving backstories on the world, trying to explain how the time machine worked, what the stakes were, what's the player role. So obviously players were just, no, no. They just wanted to experience these stories. They just wanted to play. They didn't want to read about all this. So having identified this problem, with a one single iteration, what we did was we completely removed 20% of all dialogue steps. Uh, we rewrote all the remaining dialogues, focusing on one, only one piece of the most important information per step, which reduced us to nearly 40% of all symbols. Whenever possible, we try to turn the descriptions and the exposition into gameplay, into, net, into environmental storytelling. But most importantly, we added a skip button. So let's see what happens. So yay, we got increased engagement and retention by only making changes to the dialogues. We did not tweak anything else. And surprisingly, the skip rate was still relatively low and it kept decreasing as players got more involved with our world, with our levels and the game in general. So lessons learned from that and general dialogue tips. So take one piece of the most important information you want to tell in a dialogue step. Take as little as you need to tell it. Keep sentences very simple, very casual. If you think about Twitter, that's a good format. Uh, also emphasize keywords in bold because that helps players just skim through the text. It's more digestible. Uh, if you have things like click to continue, try to give them a voice. So instead of saying click to continue, say great, I'll do it or even okay then. Because that gives players a voice in your game's world. And most importantly, embrace the skip button. So some players will never care about your stories no matter what you do. And it's just not worth losing them over writer's pride. You can make the best of text uh, and enrich your world with flavor text elsewhere. So flavor text can help you set the game's tone and also give short narrative bits about the game, about the world and about its characters. So you can do that in item descriptions, skill tool tips, achievement titles and whatever else context you have. So for example, uh, this heavy maze from Dead Island it is personal, it, it has a name, it was fashioned lovingly by Sam B, who's a character. So it's not just, just a placeholder object, it already has some story behind it. Uh, the way that Fallout Shelter does its uh, <coughs> descriptions of armor, for example, sets the tone. That it's a light-hearted game, it's a casual game, it doesn't take itself very seriously. So think of what's best for your game and try to position it using flavor text. Now free to play. 
So let's get into the specifics. So for example, this is a very common free-to-play event. If you've ever designed it, you would know. You play levels, you collect stars, you claim rewards. So, but what really pushes this over the edge is that its narrative context taps into our human nurturing instincts. So now we're not just filling up a meaningless progress bar, we're actually taking care of our little own pet Cropsy. So if you remember having a Tamagotchi, anyone? Yeah, so you know what, it, what it's like to come back and just check up on somebody you care for. Similarly, uh, in-apps don't have to be lifeless transactions. So here's obviously a currency purchase for gems, but it's also an adoption of this, quote, exclusive kitten you just can't help but love. So would that encourage players to purchase this more? If you're designing for female audiences, I think that just might. Uh, now, okay, we can all admit that gating mechanics are disliked by players, they don't love the energy systems, they don't love the timers, but the problem is that most of these are not designed based on the world's logic, of your game world's logic. So before you start thinking about gating mechanics, think of what obstacles would make sense in your game's world, what would be believable. So for example, here in Happy Cafe, players have to wait for crops to grow, meals to be cooked, seats to be emptied. So the narrative fits the timers, players are more forgiving, they won't immediately just say, oh, it's a cash grab. Social features as well can be integrated into the game's world instead of being hidden under a setting screen. So here in Happy Cafe 2, uh, players can visit their friends' cafes through the subway system, which is also conveniently placed where the NPC characters arrive and depart at the cafe and from. And when you tap this, the UI style also reinforces this narrative theme. So think of how you can integrate these naturally into your game world. And finally, if you're doing video ads, you can keep them in the game's world too. Obviously, this extrinsic reward to just claim these potions will motivate most players, but the fictional illusion will keep them immersed in the game's world. And let's face it, it's just way cooler to receive a reward from a faraway realm, right? So to wrap up, use narrative to engage your players emotionally. Think of what's best for your game. How can you enrich it? Create meaningful goals for the player. So don't just tell them what to do, but try to make them understand why they're doing it. And if that aligns with their power fantasies and their desires, even better. Now, focus on designing interactive stories. Focus on letting players be empowered in your game and basically just change the world themselves. Focus on immersive worlds and believable characters, which is basically to say that concepts, experiences and emotions should be human. And try to put your free-to-play features into a more natural, believable, integrated context. It will be more pleasant for players, it will be more beneficial to you. So remember, we all return to things that we care about. Thank you very much. Hi, so I found it really interesting that you've managed to find diegetic ways of including features like uh, in-app purchases and timers and um, social features. However, you mentioned the videos earlier and I'm, I have um, two questions actually. First one is, when in the development, when in the design process, do you actually go and say, "Oh, actually, let's look at a way to find to to implement these features into the game world, into the game narrative, in, in this like diegetic way?" And the second one is in terms of videos per se. Um, did you ever try including them, not necessarily as part, still as part of pop-ups, but having a dedicated area or space in the game where videos actually make sense to be there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, regarding the first question, when you should consider narrative, so it's best to consider it in pre-production. Because even if you don't think that your story will have a lot of narrative per se, uh, just to have a framework that will, you know, unite the whole team and they will know what kind of concepts work, what is organic, it's very good. And whatever feature you decide to make even a year after, you can still, you know, use the same narrative framework, use the same things that your writers have written to just, you know, integrated naturally. And uh, regarding the ad placement, right? So obviously, if you can find a place where in your game space it makes sense, for example, I have seen some 
uh, cases where the, there's a cafe and right there's a, like a flat screen on the cafe just hanging there and you know when it's time for an ad it shows like oh there's an ad coming up so you just kind of naturally interact with the game's world. Yeah, did I answer yeah. that? <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so would you say in your opinion personally that there is space in mobile free to play right now for narrative focused and narrative heavy games? Oh, definitely. I mean, we can just look at the success of episodic stories, let's say. Uh, because it's still a very fresh space, there's a lot to be done. Even AAA is still learning how to tell stories. So I think if you start considering this now, this can really give you a competitive edge because you either innovate mechanics or you add depth. And narrative is a very good way to add depth and add meaning to your game. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. Are there any more questions? Please, a big round of applause for Yeva.